have a question number one. In type 2 respiratory failure, there is what is the correct answer? So, answer this question is B is the answer. Well, now let's discuss the question in detail. First of all, we all know very well, normal, let's learn the basic concept. Basic concepts. which I will be writing as BC. Well, normal PaO2 is somewhere around 94 to 104. And normal PaCO2 is 40 to 45 millimeter of mercury. Right? Well, this is the partial pressure of normal oxygen and CO2. Now, whenever this PaO2 is below 60 millimeter of mercury, we call as hypoxia. It's also known as respiratory failure. So you mean to say this very, very important point. This is the golden line to remember. Okay. So that means the partial pressure of oxygen goes down. We are talking about respiratory failure. We call it as hypoxia also. Now we have two types of respiratory failure. Type 1 and type 2. PaO2. and PaCO2. In type 1, it is less than 60. Partial pressure of oxygen is less than 60. And the partial pressure of the CO2 is again less than 40. That means in nutshell, there is hypoxia and hypocarbia. Hypocarbia means CO2 is less than normal. But in type 2, it is hypoxia is there. PaO2 is less than 60. But PaCO2 is more than 45. You remember the normal PaCO2 is between 40 to 45. So that means when we talk about difference between type 1 and type 2, Major thing is it is the CO2 level, 40 and 45, less than 40 and less, more than 45. But remember, this is common, same, 60-60 is common. Okay, so with this background of basic concept, now if you look into the option, so we are very clear about it, why this is the right answer. Do we get, we, yes, we do get low CO2, uh, low O2, but low CO2, this we get in type 1 failure, not in type 2. And this is not seen in type 2 because in type 2, it should be reduced. So, now this is the best answer. Low CO2, normal PCO2 is again a wrong answer. So, now you are clear about it, why the right answer is B, Bombay. Okay. Now we talk about the following pulmonary changes are seen in restrictive lung disease except answer is vital capacity is increased. This is not the answer. Again, we go to basic concepts. Basic concept, we know very well that <clears throat> we have two types of disease. One is the obstructive airway disease. And second one is restrictive airway disease. FEV1 is reduced markedly. It is reduced. Point to be noted in both are reduced. In FEV1 is reduced in both, but it is markedly reduced in obstructive. 
is mildly reduced and restrictive. FVC, forced vital capacity, it is reduced. It is markedly reduced. That means both the values are reduced in both the diseases. But you, so you cannot differentiate by a single value. So what we go is we check for FEV1, FVC ratio. Okay. FVC ratio. This ratio is highly reduced in obstructive airway disease and it is maybe normal and for normal or increase in restrictive airway disease. What I want to convey the message to you is both the values are reduced in both. So you cannot check, but we cannot decide by single value regarding to differentiate between the obstructive and restrictive, you go by ratio. This is very, very important point. This universal question is there. And one more thing, if you now, you can see FEV1 is reduced in obstructive airway disease. Now, if you want to know the severity, severity of a case of, severity of a case of uh, obstructive airway disease, you check by FEV1. So the two important points that you got to know in this particular question now, Example, example of obstructive airway disease. It is bronchial asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis, and example of restrictive airway disease. That in that include pneumonias, it include interstitial lung disease. ILD stands for interstitial lung disease, ARDS, ARDS acute respiratory. distress syndrome there are some of the example of restrictive airway disease so with this background in restrictive airway disease fev1 fvc ratio is increased total lung capacity and residual volume are reduced Vital capacity is reduced, it's not increased. So now you are clear about it, why the right answer in this case is D. This, uh, he says, except, so all changes are seen, except uh, uh, vital capacity is reduced markedly, is not increased. Well, all the following are used for in the treatment of a patient with acute bronchial asthma, except the answer is Montelukast. This is the drug that, that we use. We do not use in acute attack. So let's learn the basic concept. What are the drugs that we use in acute asthma? So in acute asthma, the drugs that we use are in acute asthma. We use drug use are beta-2 agonist. The drug, classical example of this drug is salbutamol. Okay, salbutamol is the example. Okay, well, I have a question for you. Quickly write down the answer in your copy. Tell me any other use of salbutamol, of course, we are using in asthma and we are using in case of COPD also as a bronchodilator. And a very important question, it is used in which other condition? Quickly write down the answer, in which other condition salbutamol is used? Well, the answer is we also use in acute hyperkalemia, in the treatment of acute hyperkalemia. This is a rank number one question. 
rank number one getting question is this uh, the salbutamol is used in a treatment of acute hyperkalemia. One more question, again rank number one question, write down the answer in your copy quickly. Tell me one of the major side effects, very important, very frequent side effect of salbutamol. Quickly write down side effect. Well, the answer is tremors. These two are the very frequently asked question and the rank number one getting question for you. So we are talking about various drugs that we use in the treatment of acute attack. Now I like to talk again a very commonly asked question. We have a drug called Selmetrol. It is again a beta 2 agonist. But it is not used in acute attack. It is a long-acting drug. So we use in the treat as a prophylactic drug. We use as a prophylactic drug. It's not used in acute attack. Very, very important point. So other drugs that we use in acute attack are steroids, usually steroids. Hydrocortisone. is the drug that we use very often. We can use steroid in the form of inhalation also. Even beta 2 agonist drug, this can also be used as an inhalation nebulizer, you can say. Then we have a ipratropium bromide. Okay. Ipratropium is again a drug that we use in asthma. Of course, we use in, uh, in COPD also. Now the question is, again, write down the answer in your copy quickly. What is the mechanism of action of this drug? It's a very commonly asked question. The answer is, it is an anticholinergic drug. It's a very frequently asked question. FAQ is frequently asked question. Montelukas is a drug that we use in as a prophylactic drug. Is it used for prophylactic drug? It's especially used in exercise, it's used in exercise induced. Asthma is not used in acute attack. Now let me tell you recent advances. Well, my dear friends, recent advances are the again hot cake. Examiner are more likely to ask you latest drug rather than the routine drug. So you should know uh, all latest drugs. So now I'll be talking about recent advances. RA will be recent advances or latest update. The new drug are omelizumab. It is a IgE blocker. Then we have map, mepolizumab and re, uh, reslizumab. They are interleukin-5 antagonists. Interleukin-5 antagonists. We also have duplizumab, which is an interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 antagonists. So they are all latest drug that you should know, so-called recent advances, okay. Bidaquiline is used in the treatment of, again, a new drug, again, a recent advances, and this question will surely coming to you, is used in tuberculosis, okay. Well, if you talk about newer drugs that we use in tuberculosis are linezolate. Amoxy and clav. Clav stands for clavulinic acid. Clavulinic acid. Ofloxacin. Clarithromycin. Azithromycin. You can see these are the two which belong to question from pharmacology. Macrolides. Okay, well, macrolide also include erythromycin. 
But in tuberculosis, we use these two drugs. Okay. Ofloxacin is a type of fluoroquinolol. And these are the drugs. Now I want you to make a special note. These drugs, which I which we are using as a newer drug for tuberculosis. If you closely look and if you recall your pharmacology, these are the drugs that we primarily use for staphylococcus. Okay. Staph coca ka, ka infection we use and this drug in particular is pelinzorid is a specific drug that we use for staph infection. So now we noted that these are the drugs which are anti-staphylococci are also effective against tuberculosis and now I have a question for you. Write down the answer in your copy. We use that, we, we know very well that in tuberculosis we use INH, we use rifampicin, ethambitol, pyrazinamide and streptomycin. This is standard, uh, this thing, that word we use for internationally for the treatment, anti tuberculosis drug. Now my question is, write down the answer copy, out of all these drugs that we are using for tuberculosis treatment, which one can be used for staph infection also? Quickly write down. Which of the following five drugs can be used for treatment of staphylococci also. But the right answer is rifampicin. This is a gold medal question, not known to majority of students. Rifampicin is a very good anti staphylococcus cocus agent also. So now again, if you just look into this thing, these are all the new drugs which we use for staphylococci and we just got the new information that rifampicin is a very good anti-staphylococcal agent also. It means there is something common in the microbiology of staph and tuberculosis, tuberculosis. Maybe that all these concepts are not clear at the moment, <clears throat> maybe down the line after 20 years you can find or there may be new researches, they will show that staphylococci and mycobacterium, they belong to same family, same family. Then that time, the treatment of tuberculosis will be just 7 to 10 days, 20 years back, later on. To, today we are treating tuberculosis for 6 months. But later on when things are micro, more and more microbiology is clear, then maybe 20 years later, the treatment of staphylococcus or tuberculosis will be just like 7 to 10 days the way we treat staph infection nowadays. Well, 20 years later, when you will be taking a class the way I am taking, you will be teaching your student, okay, nowadays we, we can treat tuberculosis for 7 to 10 days. Then you will say, well, when we were student in way back in 2021, we used to treat tuberculosis for 6 to 9 months. Okay, well, then the things, the new things were not clear, but you will definitely say yes, one gentleman, Dr. Bhartia had told us a time will come when the treatment of tuberculosis is only for 7 to 10 days. Let us wait for that golden days. Now, clofazamine is the drug that we use primarily for leprosy. Well, leprosy, but now it is effective as an anti-tubercular drug, but these two drugs, Beta green and delamanin, this you should not forget. This will surely coming to you or in your exam. So I'm leaking the paper to you, but in a very honest way, they are the two latest drug, recent advances that we are using for the treatment of tuberculosis. So friends, this is the drug, we, beta green is the drug that we use in the treatment of tuberculosis, not in other conditions. Well, question number five. In acute pulmonary embolism, the most frequent ECG finding is tachycardia. Okay. This S1Q3 T3, S1Q3 T3, this is the most characteristic finding. But this is the most 
कॉमन फाइंडिंग हुए तो द टू डिफरेंट क्वेश्चन टेकिकार्डिया मीन्स हार्ट रेट मोर देन हंड्रेड पर मिनट दिस मोस्ट कॉमन फाइंडिंग एंड दिस मोस्ट करेक्टरिस्टिक फाइंडिंग लेट मी टेल यू वट आर ऑल दिस सो लेट्स गो टू बेसिक्स ऑफ ई सी जी बेसिक ऑफ ई सी जी इफ आई हैव टू टेल यू वी ऑल नो दिस ई सी जी पेपर इज लाइक दिस जस्ट लाइक ग्राफ पेपर वेरी वेरी बेसिक आई एम टॉकिंग यू जस्ट लाइक ग्राफ पेपर ईच स्क्वेयर इज ऑफ वन मिलीमीटर बाई वन मिलीमीटर साइज ओके द ग्राफ पेपर बट बी यूज इन स्कूल डेज लेट मी ड्रॉ ए डायग्राम फॉर यू आई गॉट दिस वेव या सो वी आर गेटिंग आर वेव एंड वी आर गेटिंग आर वेव द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज इफ यू हैव टू कैलकुलेट द हार्ट रेट यू quickly write down the answer what is the heart rate of this strip in front of you this the wave you got two waves is the graph paper is there calculate the heart rate in this patient quickly okay the right how to calculate heart rate is 1500 divide by number of small square between two r wave r wave r wave 1 2 3 4 5 5 In this case, the heart rate is three hundred. So this, so the first thing what we learn is, is regarding how to calculate heart rate. So whenever you are getting heart rate more than hundred, we call as tachycardia. This is the most characteristic finding. Now, second one more thing is we talk of P pulmonale. This P pulmonale, P pulmonale indicate. P pulmonal. Well, you can see normal P wave. Normal P wave is like this. Look into this. P wave. We are well aware. This is the P wave. This is the P wave. So I have drawn a separate diagram. Normal P wave height and width. both are less than 2.5 small square you can see in this case it is almost only two small square width is 2.2 uh, small square and the height is only 1.5 small square so if you get a tall p wave like this like this width is normal but tall p wave we call as p pulmonal that indicate right atrial enlargement is a right atrial enlargement that classically that we can see in uh, tricuspid stenosis now let me tell you something extra suppose you get a p wave like this like this what you are getting we are getting a wide p wave wide p wave height is normal but is a wide p wave the wide p wave when it is more than 2.5 small square we call as p mitral <clears throat> p mitral that we <clears throat> that we see in left atrial enlargement left atrial enlargement now let me talk about what is s1 q3 t3 this is the l1 i hope you know l1 lead you you get a s wave in l1 lead what we write as s s wave in l1 lead So we write as S one. Similarly, we get lead L three lead. You get Q wave, and you may get T wave inversion. This is Q wave, and we are getting T wave inversion. Inversion means it is going inverted down. So this is so called Q three T three. this the most characteristic finding okay now come the gold medal question gold medal question is 
we talked about the classical thing that we get in case of pulmonary embolism is tachycardia, most common. And S1, Q3, T3 is a characteristic. Now, can we get, what is the paradoxical finding? What is the paradoxical finding that we can get in a case of pulmonary embolism? Gold medal question is this. Rank number one question. Write down the answer quickly in your copy. In ECG, sometimes we can get a paradoxical finding. What is that? The answer is bradycardia. Paradoxical means all unexpected. We always get tachycardia, the most common, but sometimes we may get bradycardia, which is out of the blue does happen and the word we use is paradoxical bradycardia is a gold medal question. The question comes is paradoxical bradycardia is seen in and believe me this question is not known to 99% student. They do not know but you know the answer because you are the topper. You are the top rank getting student. These questions are meant for people like you who deserve top rank. So you are clear about it that when we talk about most frequent finding is this, most characteristic finding is this, and P pulmonale is right atrial enlargement. And remember, we can get uh, that paradoxical bradycardia can occur in some case of pulmonary embolism. Now, two about MODY, autosomal dominant. So again, we go to basic concept. What is MODY, the full form is maturity. Onset. Diabetes. Of young. MODY. M-O-D-Y. Well, this is the classical thing. MODY, the classical feature is seen in young people, usually below 25 years. And one of the most important and most frequently asked question about MODY, it is autosomal dominant. dominant. The answer is dominant. That means, <clears throat> it means there will be a definite family history will be positive. The family history will be definitely positive in these cases because it's dominant. It's a type of type 2 diabetes. Okay, it's a kind of type 2 diabetes. And, but serum insulin level is reduced. Something very strange. Now this finding normally we see in type 1 diabetes. But I said this is seen in type, so kind of type 2 diabetes. Again a type 2 diabetes, but still obesity hypertension, they are not the feature. They are not seen. It's a non simple, non obese normal, a normal person. And now comes the gold medal question. Why, again, write down the answer cop, uh, in your copy, why the serum insulin level is reduced? And second question, what is the treatment of this condition? That means the patient of MODY come to you. What is the treatment you like to give in this patient? So quickly write down the answer in your copy. Okay. Why serum insulin level is reduced? Of course, there are no autoantibodies. It is this point we differentiate it from type 1 diabetes. We know very well in type 1 diabetes, which is the autoimmune. There are uh, autoantibodies are there, but here we don't have any autoantibodies. But question is why serum insulin is reduced and why? What treatment? 
Well, the answer to this question is normally this is the beta cells are there. And beta cell has insulin, this is beta cell. I for insulin. Normally, after eating food which is digested, it gets converted into glucose. Glucose will come and act on the beta cell and that causes release of insulin. Insulin comes out. Glucose will act on the beta cell and it will trigger the release of insulin. Now, in this patient, this sensitivity is reduced. Glucose comes, but it cannot push out insulin. That's why the serum insulin level goes down despite beta cells are normal. They are normal functioning. There is no destruction of beta cells just like in type 1 diabetes where the beta cells are destroyed. Beta cells are normal but they do not respond to glucose. The treatment of this is self low dose, low dose sulfonyl urea. SU stands for sulfonyl urea. Why? Sulfonyl urea come will also when the what now what's the mechanism of action of sulfonyl urea? Sulfonyl urea they come and they act on the receptor and they cause the release of insulin. So sulfonyl urea has the same action what is done by the glucose, right? So, but in case of MODY, the beta cells are not responding. Sulfonyl urea is more powerful. So that's why sulfonyl urea is also known as insulin. Secretogogue. Secretogogue. Well, I can give you a day-to-day -day example also. Day-to-day -day example. This is a carom board. We all have played carom board and there are holes. Lines are there. And there is a, st a striker. Here is a striker. Here is the coin. You use a striker and you try to put this into the hole. Yes. Now you are hitting, you are using the, this striker. It comes, but this your power what you use is very less. So this coin make may come up to this place, but it doesn't enter the pot. Why? You you have hit it slowly, not powerful enough. If you give a powerful, it will straight away go to this. So exactly the same thing. In MODY, glucose comes, but it's not that powerful to release insulin. Effect is not that powerful. And when we use sulfonyl urea, which is, which is much more powerful, that's why sulfonyl urea are also known as insulin secretogog. That means they cause release of preformed insulin. And now comes the gold medal question from pharmacology. Tell me any other, any other drug you know of which is also insulin secretogog. Write down the answer in your copy. Question is, tell me any other drug you know of which is insulin secretogog. The answer is megalitinide. The group of drugs which include ripaglinide, Okay, so they are all insulin secretogog. One more question. That's why sulfonyl urea should not be combined with megalitinide because they both have the same mechanism of action. Again, a very commonly asked question. These are the gold medal questions from pharmacology for you. So now if you look into this thing, Obesity is not a feature. More common in type 1, no, it is a type cut type 2. Uh, hypertension is usually there, no, hypertension is not there. So we are very clear about MODY. Now we talk about pre-table mixed edema is seen in grave disease. Well, this is the most common wrong answer. In the hypothyroid you get myxedema is seen. Which is nothing. 
is bilateral swollen leg, legs and this is due, due to deposition of sub, subcutaneous mucopolysaccharide subcutaneous deposit of mucopolysaccharide which lead to non pitting edema non pitting edema legs are swollen but you don't get edema these are the gold medal questions non pitting edema mucopolysaccharide from biochemistry okay this is mixed edema that we get in hypothyroid now what about grave disease the grave disease has she gra answer is grave disease grave disease is a triad of is a triad of hyperthyroid of thalmopathy dermopathy okay now pre tibial myxedema what we discussed just now it is a type of dermopathy that we see in in grave disease grave disease dermopathy so this is not seen in hashimoto it's not in hyperthyroid there are many cause of hyperthyroid but but uh, grave ka it uh, the skin sign pitiable myxedema is seen only in grave disease which is a autoimmune disease grave disease is a auto immune disease okay so we are clear about it what is hypothyroid what is myxedema which is pre tibial myxedema both are you clear about it now let me show you some of the pictures lovely i'll be showing you lot of picture also you can see this is proptosis bulging of the eyes this is pre tibial myxedema the point which i discussed in the previous slides which we see in grave disease we also see clubbing in grave disease and this is known as thyroid acropaki okay this is not known to 90% student are not aware that clubbing is a feature of grave disease okay so we are very clear about it next question number 8 brown tumor is seen in it is seen in hyperparathyroid so that we will never understand unless we know the basic concept well rather before i go to about this question which is a question of rather radiology i'll first like to talk about histology and one question very simple question anybody who will answer this question correctly will get a cup of coffee as a treat write down the answer what the difference we all know very well in the bone histology we have a cortical bone and we have a type of cancellous bone simple what the different in the histology of the two bones question from basic sciences and i promise write down the answer if you write uh, write down the answer correctly you get a cup of coffee as a treat 
Don't worry, at the end of the lecture, I'll give you my contact detail also. Okay, done it. So, brown tumor, which is a question of radiology, you will never understand unless you know the basic histology, physiology, then patho, pathophysiology, everything we learn. First, we talk about normal histological examination of the cortical bone. This is the cortical cut section of cortical bone. This is the central canal. These are lacunas, empty spaces arranged concentrically. And this is known as Haversian Canal System. In this, in the center, we have a cell called osteoblast. It is a bone forming cell. It creates the new bone. That's why in the cortical bone growth occurs from inside outward. Because the bone is growing from inside, it will go outside. This is the osteoblast. And one more question from biochemistry. Whenever the osteoblastic activity increases, this increase ALP, alkaline phosphatase level is increased. Okay. Similarly, we have one more cell here, so called osteoclast. It is a bone resolving cell. That means any at any given time in the adult bone, around 5% of the bones are under constant repair. Damaged bone is removed by the osteoclast and it is repaired by the osteoblast. Then in these lacunas, in, uh, we have cells. We have cells. which are known as osteocytes, which are known as osteocytes, which maintain day-to-day -day activity of the bone. It means we got three types of cells. One is the bone forming cell, osteoblast. One is the bone maintaining cell, so-called osteocyte. And we have a third cell, which is a bone resolving cell, is the osteoclast. Well, just like in Hindu mythology, they say Brahma ji is the creator of universe. We have a osteoblast which creates the bone. Vishnu ji is the mentor of universe. We have a osteocyte which maintains the bone. And finally, Kabka Shiva, which remove all the bad elements from the earth. We have a osteoclast which remove all the bad bone. So creator, mentor and destroyer, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiv, you will never forget the histology of the bone whole life. Now let me tell you that uh, what happened in cancerous bone. Cancerous bone are like this. They don't have central canal. Central canal is not there. And the cell, blast, class, are there, blast and class are on the surface. And these are arranged in parallel. They are arranged in parallel. Okay. With the result, these osteocytes are in the, in the, Parallelly arranged, not concentrically arranged. This is a difference between cortical and cancellous bone. With this background of histology, now we come to physiology. So in, in, in case of hyperparathyroid, normally osteoblast and class activity are in parallel. 
blast and clast are in normal normal range no problem okay clast so whatever are getting removed or same is getting deposit the bone is maintained in the normal shape we know very well in hyperparathy in hyperparathyroid the clast activity is much more clast activity is much more than the blast so it will try to resolve more and more bone so let's learn about physiology physiology so now let's correlate our histology with the physiology it will try to resolve the calcium more and more calcium coming out that's the mechanism why hypercalcemia occurs in hyperparathyroid this is a basic mechanism okay now what is happening now what is happening in the bone it is removing these calcium so now these lacuna they become bigger bigger day to day example suppose in a room this the room there are chairs are there assume a classroom chairs are like this and you remove certain and the like this room is full of the chairs no space now what you do you remove certain chairs oh you are getting empty space you remove more chair more chair oh you are getting empty space exactly same thing happening here also so we are getting we are removing this lacuna or what we can say the empty space become bigger it become bigger and finally it may coalesce to make a big empty space and now this big empty space may get filled with liquid may get filled with liquid and this is the basic pathology pathophysiology of the mechanism what you call as bone cyst the basic pathology why and how bone cyst is made or or if not it may even this get me get fibrosed it may get fibrosed and this is so called and fibrosed and when we look into x ray when you take x ray it look like a tumor tumor is not there look like a tumor what we call as brown tumor the brown tumor is not a tumor very frequently asked this question is asked throughout the world very frequently asked question bone cyst the question from orthopedics very and radiology also very commonly asked the brown tumor is seen in hyperparathyroid it is not seen it's not seen in other condition this answer let me show you so this is just see beautiful picture lovely photo typical exam question is there you are getting a type of brown tumor looking like a some tumor is there and you can see one more thing brown tumors are there right well we also get in x ray when you take a x ray of skull you get small small dots look into this look into this i can enlarge the picture also what we call as pepper pot appearance very frequently asked question but as the bone get resolved look into this this is the radial side of the fingers it get resolved radial side now what is this look hand look at this thing you are all aware this is the uh, this ulna and outer side is radius so here also you will be getting resorption of the if you look into this radial side of the phalanx okay i hope you can see it like this radial side like this outer side and this is the most characteristic finding even there may be resorption of terminal phalanx there may be resorption of the terminal phalanx also classical exam question 
this is the typical, this is the most characteristic finding that we get in a case of hyperparathyroid. Okay. Next question. All are, are cause of hypercalcemia except chronic renal failure. Well, let's learn more about what are the causes of hypercalcemia. There are certain endocrine causes. In the endocrine causes regarding hyperparathyroid that we know and we know the basic mechanism also because it's all due to increased activation of the osteoclast. But in hyperthyroid also some amount of hypercalcemia can occur. It can occur in pheochromocytoma also. It can occur in, it can occur in Edison disease also. So friends, okay, thyroid, pheo and Edison are the thyroid, P for pheo, A for Edison and thyroid, PAT. Pneumatic to remember is bad. Of course, this is known to all of you. Point to be noted, hypercalcemia occur in other than parathyroid also. Cancers, breast cancer, squamous cell lung cancer. This question come in all the exam. Why it is so important to talk about squamous cell cancer? This is a universal question, very frequently asked question. Okay, this question came in FMG exam so many times. Now the question is, why to spend time? We know very well in lung cancer, typically small cell cancer of lung, small cell cancer of lung. There are a lot of neuroendocrine feature. But hypercalcemia occurs in squamous cell, not in small cell. Renal cell carcinoma, multiple myeloma and lymphoma they can also lead to hypercalcemia. Out of these, this is very important and second important is multiple myeloma. Don't forget these two. These are the ones which will be getting ranked number one for you. Most important. Lethem and thiazide cannot afford to forget this. Lethem and thiazide. We know very well lithium we use in psychiatric manifestation. One of the side effects is hypercalcemia. Now, again, a very, very important and very commonly asked question. There are two other important side effects of lithium. Write down the answer in your copy. Okay, which are the two other important side effects? The answer is, first of all, it can lead to polyuria. Why polyuria? And number two, it can lead to thyroid dysfunction. Hypercalcemia, polyuria, and thyroid dysfunction. Regarding thiazide, quickly write down the answer in your copy. It can lead to which metabolic disturbance in the body? Quickly, very frequently asked question. Write down the answer in your copy. Which dysfunction? It can lead to hyperglycemia. It can cause diabetes. It can precipitate diabetes. And in the same question in pharmacology, they ask, thyroid should not be given. Which of the following diuretics should not be given in, in diabetic? Answer is thyroid. Very, very important in drawing rank number one getting question. Vitamin D intoxication, vitamin A intoxication, simple. Milk alkali syndrome, prolonged immobilization. A person is lying on the bed for a very, very long time, for weeks, months together. It can lead to hypercalcemia, but out of this circuit, this is a very, very important question, rank number one question. So friends, if I have to talk about rank number one question, this is the rank number one question. This is the rank number one question, squamous cell, thyroid lithium, and sarcoidosis. Don't forget this one. Others you forget, I don't mind, but don't forget this one. Now, a very commonly asked question, how can 
sarcoidosis or glomerular disease can lead to hypercalcemia. Write down the answer quickly in your copy. It's a very frequently asked question. Well, the answer to this question is normally, let's learn the basic biochemistry. We all know very well 25 hydroxylation of cholecalciferol. Cholecalciferol. This occurs in the liver and it is converted into one. 25 dihydroxy cholecalciferol. C for cholecalciferol, which you already written. I am writing C only. This reaction needs PTH. And this reaction occurs in kidney. But in condition like sarcoidosis, this reaction can occur outside the kidney also what we call as extra renal, extra renal formation of vitamin D. So granulometer tissue themselves can make vitamin D. That means there's another factory, another factory where they are making vitamin D. And that's the reason why it can lead to hypercalcemia. This is true for condition like tuberculosis also. Because tuberculosis is again a type of Granulometer disease, but classically in the exam, they always talk about sarcoidosis. But at the back of the mind, you know that this can happen in any of the granulometer diseases. Well, all are a feature of Cushing disease except the answer is episodic hypertension. This is seen in pheochromocytoma. It's not seen in in uh, Cushing syndrome. In Cushing syndrome, do we do get central obesity, so-called truncal obesity? Easy bruising, what we call as purple stria. Glucose intolerance means it leads to hyperglycemia or it can precipitate diabetes. They are seen. So first I tell you the basic concept. Why hypertension occurs and why hyperglycemia occurs. That you will never understand unless you know the basic concept. First of all, they lead to hyperglycemia. Why? We are all aware in Cushing syndrome there is excess of steroid. This excess of steroids, it can lead to increased gluconeogenesis. Glycogen increase, glycogenolysis. And they contribute to hype. These two mechanisms are the reason why high blood sugar occurs in case of uh, Cushing syndrome, all because of steroid lead to this problem. Now, why hypertension occurs? For that, we go to the basic concept. The question is why hypertension occur in case of Cushing syndrome. So normally we all know if you talk about normal physiology, we have a aldosterone, A for aldosterone. In the normal physiology, we know very well this it absorbs that aldosterone act on the DCT and collecting tubule. It absorbs maybe two sodium are being reabsorbed. Water follows passively. Now we all know that when we talk about natural steroid is cortisol. Cortisol also have a mineralocorticoid activity.
and due to mineral corticoid activity, uh, it also tend to absorb sodium and water. And just now we talked about this. This is so-called glucocorticoid activity. Uh, so steroid raise the blood sugar by glucocorticoid and they also have mineralocorticoid activity which is just like aldosterone like. So that's why I have written aldosterone just for better understanding. So now in Cushing syndrome, there is excess of cortisol. That means more and more mineralocorticoid activity. So now maybe four sodium are reabsorbed and more water will be absorbed. And ultimately, it will lead to increase intravascular volume. It lead to increase intravascular volume and that is the reason the will to increase BP. This is a constant phenomenon, not episodic. That's a basic mechanism why and how hypertension occur in a case of in a case of uh, Cushing syndrome. Right now, in Edison's disease, reverse will happen in Edison disease. There is no cortisol, there is no aldosterone also. So sodium and water will not be reabsorbed. And one more thing, not reabsorbed. That uh, one more thing that now whenever sodium are getting absorbed, like initially there are two sodium are absorbed, body has to secrete two positive particles. Why? Law of electrostat. Two positive in, two positive go out. Now in case of Cushing syndrome, four sodium have come in, that means body will be losing double H ion, double potassium. That's the reason why hypokalemia occurs in Cushing syndrome and that's why metabolic alkalosis occur. Why metabolic alkalosis? Because large amount of HN has been secreted into the nephron. Okay, this is what happened in Cushing syndrome. Now in Edison disease, the sodium and water will not be reabsorbed. So they will be reduced in Edison disease. This reduce intravascular volume. That lead to low BP. And moreover, uh, cortisol level is reduced. There is reduced uh, blood sugar. Why? Reduce glycogenolysis and reduce gluconeogenesis. So blood sugar is reduced, BP is reduced. That's why, due to these two reasons, the commonest presenting feature of Edison disease is fatigue. Fatigue what we fatigue malaise and so called asthenia asthenia occur fatigue malaise is the feature of addison disease low sugar and low bp with this background we come back to our now we are clear about it well other feature that we see in cushing disease i told you so let me show you some pictures so you are clear about Glucose intolerance. Now, this is the buffalo hump that we see in Cushing disease. Moon shaped face. Classical picture. Okay, this is the purple stria. This is due to easy bruising. Look into more of the bruise. Hirsutism can be there in Cushing syndrome. This is due to increase endogens. Hirsutism is seen in Cushing syndrome. Well, this question. Partially, I discussed in the previous hyperglycemia. So, we learned in the previous question in Edison disease, hypoglycemia occurs. Hypotension, you, yes, we know. And we learned the mechanism also. This is due to reduce intravascular volume. Hyperkalemia because potassium is retained in the body because sodium is not getting reabsorbed. Potassium remains in the body that lead to hyperkalemia. 
hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, because sodium is not getting reabsorbed. Hyperglycemia is not a feature of Addison's disease. Well, one more finding that we can see is hyperpigmentation. This is due to, in, in Addison disease, ACTH level is increased. And ACTH, and there is, has a MSH-like activity also. ACTH is a hormone which is a, uh, that is, which, which stimulate cortisol sec secretion. MSH is a, uh, is a pigment, melanocyte. stimulating hormone, which causes increased pigmentation. That's why we get pigmentation, hyperpigmentation in Addison disease. But now come the gold medal question, not known to 90%. In some cases of, some cases of Addison disease, there can be even vitiligo also, vitiligo. But this see, is seen only in autoimmune variety of Addison disease, not otherwise. We know very well Addison disease ka or hypoadrenalism can occur due to so many causes. But in autoimmune variety, we may get either hyperpigmentation or we may get even vitiligo also. Look into this. So if you are getting this vitiligo and patient is a Hypoadrenalism, we are sure we are dealing with the autoimmune, autoimmune type of hypoadrenalism. Now, write down the answer in your copy. I have a question for you that in India, most common cause of hypoadrenalism is a very simple but very frequently asked question. In India, the most common cause of hypoadrenalism is what? Write down the answer quickly in your copy. Answer is tuberculosis. So, vitiligo occurs in around 10 to 20 percent patients with autoimmune Addison disease. Now is a very simple question. Which of the following is not a part of classical tired or diabetic symptom? Well, the answer is polyphagia. Uh, most people go for weight loss. Answer is polyphagia. Okay. But you will say, but sir, 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 I remember in my classes I was taught the classical tired is polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia. I can show you, it is written in Robbins also, but that is written wrongly. Well, you can very well see Harrison, 20th edition, it is given their classical triad. Well, a movie I thi, there was a movie called Munna by MBBS, and I am sure all of you must have seen that movie. In that movie, if you recall, there was a scene, uh, Sanjay Dutt, the hero, is made to sit uh, in, on the stage, on a, on a table and chair. And the people ask him a question. The question is asked to him, what is diabetes? Sanjay Dutt, the hero, answer like this. Diabetes is a state of condition where we have a polyuria, excess of thirst, so-called polydipsia, and unusual weight loss. Even the Munna Bhai knows the classical triad is polyuria, polydipsia, and weight loss. So next time when you will see this movie, when the scene comes, when this scene will come, definitely you will be thinking about me. Yeah, Dr. Bhatia talked about the diabetic symptom, the classical triad is polyuria, polydipsia, and weight loss. Polyphagia is a feature of diabetes, but it's not a classical triad of diabetic symptom. Well, the characteristic feature of frontal lobe tumor is antisocial behavior. 
the answer key given to you there was a typing error but the right answer is antisocial behavior why this answer that you will ne never understand unless you know the anatomy and physiology of the frontal lobe the lobe the central sulcus i'm talking about cerebral hemisphere central sulcus the part this is a motor cortex which lies this is a central sulcus central okay central sulcus and this is a motor cortex the part in front in fact this whole is frontal lobe this whole is frontal lobe let me draw with a yellow color this whole is frontal lobe we have a lateral sulcus this is lateral sulcus okay this is parieto occipital sulcus parieto occipital sulcus this is the occipital lobe this is t for temporal lobe and p for parietal lobe two simple at your level you are all learned people so as of now we'll talk about frontal lobe well frontal lobe this is the is one area in the very this area in the very frontal part if you can keep your hand in the very proximal part of your head this is the prefrontal cortex this is the pre frontal cortex this area which i have marked like this this area of this area for social behavior and personality yes. area of social behavior and personality this is the anatomy now let me discuss physiology i said prefrontal cortex is the area of social behavior and personality what do you mean by physiology well you come to the college class you wear your normal dress you go home when you are about to sleep you change your dress and you wear nighty pajama and slipper etc when you reach home can you come to the class with the same dress no way you cannot come to the class with nighty chappal pajama etc etc why we have a area of social behavior we decide which dress is to be worn or which is not to be worn okay well i give, let me give you one more example you are attending the class in your college and after the college you have to go to a function i remember you are wearing the usual college dress can you or will you go to that function with the same dress ladke to chale bhi jayenge boys can go they don't mind but ladies no 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 way i can guarantee 101% none of the lady who is listening to me will say i am going they will never go never why ladies want to get dressed up in the best possible way boys are hardly males no problem and i tell you one more thing which you are none of you know that in ladies of course this i talk to you regarding area of the social behavior this one i am talking about area of social behavior personality 
Anatomically, it is the size is same in both men and women, boys and girls. But I tell you, it is much more functional, much better functioning in ladies. The point what you don't know. Ladies have a much better observation power. For us, this is a yellow color. This is a yellow color. But for lady, it is a healthy yellow and uh, or sunflower yellow, light greenish yellow. We all our yellow shades are different because they can differentiate much better than what we can differentiate. Okay. And the area of, uh, well, you agree with me. Yes, you all agree with me. Yeah. But remember, anatomically, they are same. Well, now this is that due to this area of social behavior personality, we have to bind by the rules of society. We go by rules of society. You are driving the car in a main road. You drive very carefully because it's a rush area. If you drive rash, you might do some accident. Now what happened? After you have taken somebody, you have taken the alcohol. That inhibition is gone. Now he will drive the car in a very full speed, in a very rush area, bound to do some accident. That's why when you go to road, it is written, don't drink and drive. Don't drink and drive. Sharap PK Gadi na chalayin. This is the reason because that social inhibition is gone. Well, I told you when a person take alcohol, that social inhibition is gone. Even language changes. They say in India, maximum English is spoken in which state in India. They say from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. it is Kerala. But after 8 p.m., it is Punjab. Well, Punjabi fellow will have a bottle of whiskey and he will forget Punjabi and start speaking English or what we say. Punjabi chhodke angrezi bolna shuru kar dega. Punjabi chhodke angrezi bolna shuru kar dega. Those who know Punjabi, they will understand me better. So, this is all area of social behavior, personality. So, definitely now we go to pathology and psychiatry aspect. If this is damaged due to any reason, the patient will have a antisocial behavior. Antisocial behavior will be there. Okay. And these are, this will be seen in cerebellar disease. And this is, will be seen in again brain stem lesion or uh, this is seen in bulbar palsy. This is seen in temporal lobe region. So this is seen in frontal lobe. I hope things are clear to you. Cortical blindness is seen in occipital lobe. Why this answer? Let's go to basic anatomy and physiology. Then we go to ophthalmology. Anatomy and physiology, this is the brain. This is the eye optic nerve and this they go to occipital lobe. So like you are watching me, you are watching me, your, it is you are watching me with your eyes, eyes and it's the optic nerve, ON is optic nerve which is taking impulse to the occipital lobe. So it's the occipital lobe where actually film is getting made in your brain. So definitely if the some lesion occurs in occipital lobe like this, to what happen? Picture will not form. Although eyes are normal, optic nerve is normal, both are normal, N for normal. But still the person cannot see because the lesion occurs in the where actual film is getting made and this is so called cortical blindness. The cortical blindness is what we see in occipital lobe lesion. In parietal lobe lesion, in dominant parietal lobe lesion, you get Gertzman syndrome. In, bi in, bi in bilateral 
टेम्पोरल लोबलीजन You get Kluwer Bucy syndrome. The Kluwer Bucy syndrome, bilateral temporal lobe lesion. What are the features of Kluwer Bucy syndrome? Apathy. Orality. hyperphagia increased sexual activity increased sex desire they are the feature of bilateral temporal lobe lega lesion well let me give you a day to day example suppose there is a patient young patient or 20 year or 25 year got admitted in your ward and the history given that he had a road side accident and the mri shows bilateral temporal lobe injury is there so you go in the morning you take around and you say kya hal hai iska how is he patient attendant will say doctor since the time of accident he is always lying on the bed like this nothing doing so called apathy apathy means sust baitha hua hai doing nothing and the patient attendant say we, but we don't have any problem with this what else you say when we wake him up he will try to touch everything with the mouth like look at me so called orality patient attendant say we don't have a problem with orality also then what else when we wake him up for food he eats a lot he eats so much that he takes his own food and he eats our food also attendant say we don't mind for that also then you ask what the problem with the problem sir 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 the problem is when the nurse comes to check his pulse bp he does all teasing to the nurse friends golden line to remember patient taking panga or teasing the nurse is clover buci syndrome don't forget in key sectors are so if you are getting road side accident patient and he they teasing the nurse you think about clover buci syndrome okay so you are clear about each one of them then we talk about speech broca's area is located this question come speech a, a very commonly asked question in fmg exam so first we learn the anatomy then we learn the physiology then we learn the neurology and then we learn the medicine also so so let's learn anatomy and physiology first we learn about anatomy this is the central sulcus we learn this is what lateral sulcus this is what parieto occipital sulcus in the posterior part of temporal cut temporal lobe we have a auditory area we have auditory area this one in the superior temporal gyrus we have a wernicke area and this the motor cortex we learn leg area is at the top and more and the and the uh, head area is the bottom point to be noted in the cerebral cortex body is hanging upside down leg area is the top and the head area is at the at the bottom then we have a in the in the inferior frontal gyrus we have broca's area broca's area is a motor speech area it lies in the inferior
फ्रंटल गायरस एंड आई टॉक टू यू दैट वन के एरिया लाइज इन दी सुपीरियर टेम्पोरल गायरस and we also know very well these are located in the dominant hemisphere dominant hemisphere we call as if you are right handed like the way i am right handed most of you are right right handed then in our case it is left sided they say dominant in left lefty people they more of a right sided dominant is there okay this general of course exceptions are there but anyway by and large general consensus is left hemisphere is more dominant this is the anatomy and these two are attached to each other via arcuate fasciculus these two are attached to each other via arcuate physical this one this blue color that me wernicke area and broca's area are attached to each other via arcuate physical this is the anatomy now let's talk about physiology we have to learn in integrated way so let's integrate with physiology then we'll integrate with medicine also like i asked you what is your name my words they go to your ears from ear they go to auditory area it is there in bilateral both the both these temporal lobe bilateral from here the message come to wernicke area which is lying in the superior temporal gyrus in the dominant type i presume you are right handed it will go to your left a uh, dominant uh, cerebral hemisphere in the wernicke area here speech is understood my question was what is your name you listen and it goes to your one ke area where you could understand oh my name is being asked now this one ke area will send a message to broca's area via arcuate fasciculus broca area is a motor speech area now this will give a command to head area god is the greatest engineer it has made broca's area quite near to head area now the head area will give my name is x y z that's the basic physiology of speech also i hope you are clear about this so a quick recap what is your name they go to ear they go to bilateral auditory center in temporal lobe they come to dominant temporal lobe in the superior temporal gyrus in the wernicke area where speech is understood that why wernicke area is also known as sensory speech area and message will come to broca's area which is a motor speech area via arcuate fasciculus and broca's speech area will give a command to vocal cord lips and the answer come my name is x y z now let's correlate anatomy physiology with medicine suppose there is one patient who is suffered head injury and he got injury in the wernicke area to him you ask what is your name your word go to his ear they go to auditory area yes some sound has come but now he come to wernicke area but he could not understand why wernicke is not working so now automatically he will say you ask what is your name remember broca's is working normally so you ask what is your name no no i have taken my lunch are ya tera naam kya hai what is your name no 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 i will not go to movie you are asking something he is replying something so in wernicke defect there is 
इरेलेवेंट स्पीच इरेलेवेंट रैपिड स्पीच इज देयर वाई इरेलेवेंट यू आर आस्किंग समथिंग इज रिप्लाइंग समथिंग ऑल सेंसलेस स्पीच बट वी टॉक सपोज यू गेट अनदर पेशेंट हुज वनिके एरिया इज ऑल राइट हिज ब्रोका इज इज डैमेज यू आस्क वट इज योर नेम your word go to his ear they go to artery area he understood your question is what is your name he understood he gives a command to brokas but brokas area is not working so it cannot give a command to head area you ask what is your name he is standing like this what is your name no reply will you go to movie will you take dinner are musad bolo speak out from mouth he cannot speak will you go to a movie he say yeah she like this but he cannot speak but he understood why a vernicky area so in broca speech defect speech outflow is reduced speech outflow is reduced he is not able to speak out suppose vernicke area is all right and broca area is all right and defect lies in arcuate fasciculus in arcuate fasciculus arcuate fasciculus repetition is lost repetition is lost now come the gold medal question write down the answer in your copy tell me in arcuate fascicular lesion why repetition is lost how it is lost anybody will answer this question correctly will get a cup of coffee as a treat write down the answer how what the mechanism of repetition lost in arcuate fascicular lesion well i'm sure by now you're written the answer answer is stop writing listen to me very carefully you ask the patient what is your name go to artery vernicke and come to brocas area yes that's the mechanism okay but when arcuate fasciculus is lost is gone you cut maybe you are by scissors you cut it remember his brocas area is normal and vernicke area is normal this no problem problem is arcuate fasciculus so now he is hungry he is hungry he says i want food why he can speak because his brocas area is working normally i want food now you say what did you say please repeat now your words go to vernicke area but vernicke cannot give a command to brocas because in between there is no connection so he is not able to repeat because message cannot go from uh, vernicke area to brocas area i hope you are clear about it to summary summary is vernicke area is senseless speech in brocas area speech outflow is lost well i'm sure you are tired by now let me give a day to day example in brocas p defect he is not able to speak out well this happen normally also under physiological condition more in boys a boy loves a girls a, a boy there he love a girl but he doesn't know how to express okay वो कहते हैं ना दिल की बात जुबान पे आए हम कह नहीं पाते हैं दैट इज टाइप ऑफ ब्रोकास डिफेक्ट और आपकी बात वो नहीं समझती है दैट इज वर्निके डिफेक्ट वैसे बताऊं समझती सब है अपनी सहेली को अपनी गोइंग विद हर फ्रेंड शी विल डू लाइक दिस टू हर फ्रेंड लुक 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 ब्रोकास डिफेक्ट ब्रोकास डिफेक्ट दिल की बात वहां पे आए ना कह पाए ब्रोकास डिफेक्ट दोस्तों जब आए बात तो कह डालना वरना जिंदगी एक भर का पछतावा होगा बात तो दिल में थी वो सामने थी और मैं कह नहीं पाया यू विल रिग्रेट फॉर होल लाइफ 
So I hope you have learned about the basic concept about broadcast effect and Wernicke effect. Now things are clear to you. It lies in dominant inferior frontal gyrus, okay, and it is this this location of Wernicke area. Okay. Most common cause of SCH, answer D here. And I am sure most of you have gone for this answer. It's the most common wrong answer. Because trauma is the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage. But here, so if suppose in this the option was some bleeding disorder, maybe it's bleeding disorder. This was the option number D, bleeding disorder. Then the answer would have been berry aneurysm. But if trauma or trauma is there again, trauma is the answer. So answer here is non, none of the above. Friend, SCH is a VVIP topic. VVIP topic means dunya ke har ek exam pe ispe sawal aata hai. There's not a single exam where question doesn't come on SCH. Universal. What question will come? The question occurs if sudden severe headache sudden onset of severe attack without fever. Usually fever is not there. If the question come like this, this is subarachnoid hemorrhage. And there may be neck rigidity. Which is seen in meningitis. But in meningitis, fever is a feature. Fever is usually not a feature in this. And now come the one more simple question. Which is the most accurate test? To diagnose subarachnoid hemorrhage, write down the answer in your copy. What is the most accurate test to diagnose subarachnoid hemorrhage? Quickly write down. Well, I am sure you must have written the CT scan. This is the most common wrong answer. If they ask what is the first initial test? Then the answer is CT scan. CT scan is positive in around 95% cases. In 5% cases, CT scan may be normal. In that case, you go for lumbar puncture. If you see RBCs in CSF, this is the most accurate test. So lumbar puncture is the most accurate test. Well, this is a CT scan you can see, blood, okay, this is the normal CSF, xanthochromia, the CSF turns yellow, but this happens if the CSF are done after about 6 to 10 hours, by the time the RBC get lysed and they give a yellow color, so-called xanthochromatic, xanthochromatic CSF, that's a classical thing that we see in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Well, the complication that can happen in a case of subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage, vasospasm. And that's also the cause of long-term morbidity. Long-term problem occurred to vasospasm. To prevent this, we give drug like nimodipine. Then second complication is re-bleed. Re-bleeding can happen. 
there can be hydrocephalus. Now, there can be a electrolyte imbalance also. Write down the anthony copy. Which electrolyte imbalance can occur in a case of subacnoid hemorrhage? Quickly write down the answer. Which electrolyte imbalance can happen in subarachnoid hemorrhage? The answer is hyponatremia. Low sodium, this is due to SIADH. Full form is syndrome of inappropriate secretion of ADH. Syndrome of inappropriate secretion of ADH. Excess of water is absorbed in by ADH and that due to hyponatremia. Gout is a disorder of purine metabolism. Okay. And purine metabolism that gives rise to uric acid. Simple question from biochemistry. But the question is, it is due to deposition of uric acid? No. The gout occurs due to mono sodium. urate crystals what we write as MSU it's this one which leads to gout in this we get needle shaped crystals you get needle shaped crystals Okay. Most common joint involved is great toe joint. Well, we know it leads to gout. Gout, great toe joint, and it is red, hot, and tender. It's very painful. It is very painful, hot, red, tender. There may be tophi. Tophi is soft tissue. So you may get even deposition in the soft tissue, so called tophi, in gout. You can see this. Okay, tophi. And of course, don't forget they may even make uric acid stone also. They may do uric acid stone also. So the, the, the clinical feature of gout includes severe joint pains, I told you. The joint, great toe joint, rod, hair, hot, red, tender. In, it's a type of inflammatory arthritis. Involvement of small joints, especially great toe joint, but it can involve uh, joint of the hand also. I have shown you picture also. Look into this. You can, this, this is a, this also, but most commonly great toe joint. It can even involve the ankle, knee also. And I told you it is a deposition of monosodium urate crystal, not uric acid, in the synovium. The initial site, the deposition occurs in the synovial membrane, and that's why the answer is all of the above. But I have got severe joint pains. It lead to grade four tenderness. Grade four tenderness. Now the question is again. Simple question. Write down the answer in your copy. What are the causes of grade 4 tenderness? What are the causes of grade 4 tenderness? One is gout. What are the other causes of grade 4 tenderness? Well, now, before you, before I proceed further, let me tell you what are the 
grading of tenderness. Grade one, tenderness is when you touch and you can elicit the pain. You touch, dard hai, pain hai, he says, yes, I have pain. This is grade one tenderness. Grade two, you touch, ah, ah, patient, ah, winches with pain is grade two tenderness. Grade three, you touch, he withdraws, oh, doctor, he withdraws, grade three tenderness. Grade four, you try to touch, ah, 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 doctor, don't touch, don't touch, ah, 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 don't touch, grade four tenderness. So grade one means you touch pain hai, dard hai, yes, I have pain, grade one, grade two, ah. Grade three, he withdraws. Grade four, he won't let you touch. Grading or tenderness, this is the rank number one getting question. Believe me, not, not known to 99.9%, .9%, they are not aware of this point. Now come the gold medal question again from orthopedic, what are the cause of grade four tenderness? Septic arthritis. This question from orthopedic, septic arthritis. It can occur in gout and arthritis occurring in rheumatic fever. Arthritis occurring in rheumatic fever. They are cause of grade 4 tenderness. Okay. Now look into the needle shaped crystals. Okay. Look into this needle shape crystal, classical exam question. This was came in one of your FMG exam also. In fact, I have told you in the very beginning, all the questions that I have taken are from FMG, previous FMG exam. So you are actually getting the taste of the FMG exam. So we are getting these needle shape crystals are there, needle like needles. This is the X-ray of gouty toe phi. I've already shown you picture. Now, if you take X-ray, you get a picture like this. And if you take a X-ray of the hand or any joint, you get G sign or mouse bitten appearance, also known as martel sign. So what you get is a type of overhanging type of picture. Look into this. Look into this. overhanging type of picture, so-called mouth bitten, overhanging, G sign, okay, G sign also they would call us, this is what is x-ray of the hand and this gaudetophile. Let us, let's discuss pharmacology. We learned about orthopedic, we learned about biochemistry, we learned about medicine, clinical side. Now let's talk about Febixo, newer drugs for gout, Febixostat. It's a new xanthine oxidase inhibitor. Pre, of course, we are using allopyrinol. But the new drug is Febixostat. Then we have a benzbromeron. It's a type of new uricose uric drug. It causes increased uric acid secretion. Excretion in the urine is benzbromerone. Resburicase. Normally what happened, this I told you is a disorder of purine metabolism. Normally purine is converted into uric acid. Now this will convert, resburicase will convert urine into uh, into into allantois. Urine into allantois, uh, purine into allantois, which is a water soluble molecule, it goes out of the body. But most important is low sartan, Phenofibrate and amlodipine. We are these are three well known molecules to you. We know very well that low sartan and amlodipine they are the drug for hypertension. Phenofibrate is a drug to control lipid. So these drugs also have a uricose uric action. They cause 
Kutte cause increased uric acid excretion. The question which came in FMG exam, which is the drug of choice for hypertension? Drug of choice for hypertension in a case of gout. And of course, their option will be low sartan or amlodipine. One will be there. I mean, your question it was low sartan, low sartan or anything else. The ditch the drug of choice. Okay, for for uh, for patient of gout with hypertension. Okay, well, now I have one more question. Which is the drug? Which ARB? ARB is an angiotensin receptor blocking drug just like losartan. So losartan, the angiotensin receptor blocking drug, angiotensin receptor blocking drug. ARB. This we use drug of choice gouty losartan. Now question is, which ARB should be used in diabetes and why? Write down the answer quickly in your copy. Which ARB should be used in diabetes? Quickly write down the answer copy. This is a rank number one getting question. Answer is tell me certain. This is a one ARB which also acts on P, P, A, R, gamma receptor. Tell me certain, of course, this is an anti hypertensive drug, but it also acts on the P, P, A, R. Gamma receptor and and we know very well that drug like glitazone, like pioglitazone, which is an anti-diabetic drug, it acts on the PPAR gamma receptor. So tell me, Saturn has a mild anti-diabetic action also. Okay, now we got a new. Lipid drug. We got a new anti lipid drug. New anti lipid drug which acts on the P, P, A, R, alpha, P, P, A, R, gamma receptor. Write down the answer what is the name of that drug? The anti lipid drug which act on the PPER alpha and PPER gamma receptor. The name the drug, after the drug. New drug, latest recent advances, seroglitazone. Is the one drug which, which is a anti lipid drug. Which act on the PPER alpha and PPER gamma receptor. Let me tell you some of the newer anti diabetic drugs. Okay, we have got newer anti diabetic drugs. We got GIP, GLP, 1 agonist. Liraglutide, Exenatide, we have DPP-4 inhibitors, okay. Citagliptin, so these are very very important questions.
so you are clear about many more questions regarding low sartan arb one more point which i would definitely like to mention in diabetes not only we have to control the blood sugar but we have to control bp also because many of the vascular complication they can be cured cannot be cured unless you control the bp also so it's a mandatory for a diabetic patient to control blood sugar as well as bp so we have to use the drug the most appropriate way so that bp and sugar are well under controlled okay now we start with cardiology all phase of jugular venous pulse and their cause are correctly match except the answer to this question is a c wave is not due to onset of atrial systole quite possible there is many of you have marked this is not atrial systole rather it is due to ventricular systole i hope those who have done the mistake they will realize yes so the the rule of the attempting question is read the question and options very carefully well let's learn the basic physiology regarding jvp jvp is a very very important question in fmg exam in every exam you usually get one question first of all when we look for jvp you have to you ask the patient to lie so ka lie and then its head should be raised at 45 degree something like this okay bed and the patient head like something like that yeah and first of all what angle 45 degree and is located in the two head of sternocleidomastoid okay and the classically this is seen in raise in right heart failure so there are three questions angle 45 lie bit where the lo anatomical location between the two heads of sternocleidomastoid and it is raised jvp raise in right heart failure okay so as i talking to you the various wave that we see first we learn the basic then we talk about we have this is the a wave well a wave is produced due to atrial contraction atrial systole in the option it was it was what you did c wave as not due to atrial systole or atrial contraction this is e wave well atria contract the whole blood comes to the ventricle then start the ventricle systole ventricle systoles when begins these are the valves these are tricuspid valve and mitral valve when ventricle systole just begins this get closed this get okay when it closed these they get closed they are already already closed and they these also close so in the very early stage of ventricle systole all the four valves four valves means mitral valve aortic valve pulmonary valve and tricuspid valve all the four valves are closed and this is known as iso volumetric ventricle systole systole so it means in a for a very fraction of a second 
the ventricle are contacting against all the four closed valve. During that valve, this valve cusp, they slightly move upward. And this movement produces C wave or C notch. After that, when the ventricle, uh, when the valves close, the blood goes out, X descent comes. In the meantime, in the meantime, uh, after that, atria again, blood start coming to the atria. So this produces the V wave. So this is due to atrial systole. This is due to passive filling of the atria. ATR are getting blood and that will produce V wave. And Y descent is produced when tricuspid valve open. That produces Y descent. I'll be talking more about this opening of tricuspid valve later later on, but as of now, so we are clear about this is due to atrial caucus systole. This is due to bulge of the bulge of the <coughs> tricuspid valve cusp into the into the right atrium during the isovolumetric ventricle contraction. This is due to passive filling of the of the at right atrium, and this is when the tricuspid valve open. You get white descent. With this background, so so what we got the question was. X descent, atrial relaxation, or so called, uh, when ATR getting relaxed, and V wave willing of the, of the atria, and this is due to emptying of blood from right atrium into right, right ventricle. This is the wrong answer. So we are clear about why the, why the answer is A. Well, the typical finding in cardiac temperament is absent Y descent, okay, is a finding. So let me tell you, abnormality and JVP, this is very, very important. From this slide, you'll be definitely getting one question. I'm leaking the paper to you, but in a very honest way. Raise JVP with normal waveform. This is right heart failure, which I've shown you in the picture also. But the gold medal question is this, Ray JP in the absent pulsation, we know very well normally JVP has a pulsation, but sometimes you may can see distended JVP without no pulsation, that is superior vena cava obstruction, very, very important finding. In this extra edge point, in this you will also get, not only you get non-pulsatile JVP, this is also known as non-pulsatile JVP. Additional finding will be prominent, prominent upper chest vein. Upper chest veins are very, very prominent. The additional finding that you get in this patient. Large A wave, again a very important question, this we get in tricuspid stenosis, pulmonary arterial hypertension, tricuspid stenosis in short TS and Pulmonary arterial hypertension, we write as PAH. In this, we get large A wave. But very, very large A wave, cannon wave. This we get in complete heart block. This is a universal question, very important. That means now in other way around, the question can be asked to this way also. Complete heart block, when the atria contact, when the atria contracts, against the closed tricuspid valve. You get a very, very prominent A wave, so-called can wave. Absent A wave, atrial fibrillation, very obviously we learned the A wave is due to atrial contraction. So definitely there is no atrial contraction in atrial fibrillation, A wave will be absent. Giant V wave and tricuspid regurgitation is a very, very important question. And slow Y descent is seen in tricuspid stenosis and cardiac temperament. This is the universal question. 
very very important question so friends in this the gold medal question are this this is a gold medal question this is a gold medal question gold medal question and very frequently asked question so don't forget these yellow mark they are very often asked this exam well i have one more question for you write down the answer in your copy i just talked to you regarding white descent let's go through this white descent i talked to you my simple question is there this white descent correspond to which heart sound okay and this a wave correspond to which heart sound there this are the basic but the gold medal question not known to 90% students these are the one which are going to get a first seat which you deserve i hope you have written the answer in your copy question is why descent in jvp correspond to which heart sound and a wave in jvp correspond to which heart sound